welcome to the October 1st work session. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Sublette, City Attorney, to uh, uh, request a motion to go into executive session. Mr. Sublette? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Motion to go into executive session for 40 minutes to discuss potential litigation. Including? Including um, myself, the City Manager, Shelly Starr, um, and the Council on Governing Bodies. Okay. The rest of the people covers everything. I was raring to go. <laughs> well, we well, we gave you six and a half minutes. <laughs> Just let me know when you're ready. <laughs> okay, Carol, go, go ahead. Okay. Do I need to repeat all that, or do you want me to? Just real quick. Just, okay. Um, this is the WP. Uh, water Pollution Control Labor Agreement. We uh, um, entered, to, entered into an agreement for a one-year contract, and uh, the wage package for that contract is, has two components. The 0.75% increase to the wage matrix across the board, and then a one-step increase for eligible employees who receive a meet expectation or better on their annual performance evaluation. That, I uh, say, the 2014 package comes to a 2.14%. Now, when you include all the benefits, it comes to a percent of the increase, total increase to the budget for 2014 is 3.35. I'll stand for questions, and we do have someone here from the union if we have questions for that individual. Do we have any questions or concerns? Mr. Mayor? Well, I was going to suggest that perhaps due to the difficulty of your presentation, when this comes before the council, maybe we'll have it. It might be a good idea to have it again so that we can focus in on it um, that we, we can't really deny in this place to come. Happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Union, uh, Mr. Union? <laughs> Don Fincham, excuse me. Mr. Right. Union, Don Fincham, yes. how yes. are you today? Good, thank you. Do you have any comments or questions that you... Uh, no, it was ratified by the members and uh, Phil is a fair contract for us all. So. Questions for Mr. Union? Sir? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is that all you have for us, Mr. Teenager? I believe that's all that was scheduled on the work session, Deputy Mayor. Okay. Is that all that's scheduled? Any other questions or concerns from the council? Seeing none, this concludes our work, work session.
you please rise and give your attention to Mr. Harmon for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, we have two proclamations this evening. The first one pertains to 1904H week. Whereas it began in rural America and it now serves youth in urban and suburban as well as rural communities, whereas 4-H is a nationwide program led by state land-grant universities in cooperation with local county extension councils, and whereas each of the 4-Hs on the clover represent ways youth can grow and develop in 4-H, whereas as part of the 4-H experience, 4-H members are encouraged to learn about and contribute to the betterment of their communities. Now, therefore, I, Larry Wogat, Mayor of the City of Topeka, Kansas, do hereby declare the week of October 6 to 12, 2001, 2013, as National 4-H Week. And in the City of Topeka, urge the citizens to learn more about 4-H and to become more involved in 4-H as members, club letters, club leaders, or volunteers. And we have here the Johnny County 4 H agent, Candace Mirabold. Thank you. I'd like to thank Mayor Wolgast for signing our proclamation. October is the beginning of the new 4 H year, so that's why we have our 4 H week, October 6th through the 12th. Um, we are proud to have 350 4 H members in Shawnee County, all across the county, and hope to grow that number. 4 H is a positive youth development organization for um, youth 7 to 18, where we are learning by doing and listening with better leaders and neighbors. And our second proclamation is in uh, honor of Habitat for Humanity. Whereas Habitat for Humanity International is a global organization creating home ownership opportunities throughout North America, Africa, Middle East, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean since 1976. And whereas the Topeka Habitat for Humanity, working with a variety of Topeka organizations and community volunteers, have together built over 75 homes provided services to over 200 individuals, and whereas this spirit of working together continues to bring hope to people living in our community, and whereas Habitat for Humanity International has built and rehabilitated more than 200,000 homes with families in need, becoming a true world leader in addressing the issues of poverty housing, and now therefore very I, Larry Walgast, Mayor of the City of Topeka, to hereby declare October 7, 2013, as World Habitat Day, in honor of the city of, in honor of Habitat in Topeka, and urge the citizens of Topeka to participate through support of our Topeka Habitat for Humanity. And I believe the board president is Ed Plaza. Tonight we join our Habitat for Humanity family as we celebrate World Habitat Day and try to bring awareness to the need of our community for safe, decent and affordable housing. In uh, 2011, Habitat for Humanity celebrated building over half a million homes worldwide. 
here in Topeka, as the mayor indicated, we have built 75 homes since 1985. Six are currently in progress. The goal of Habitat for Humanity is to provide affordable housing options with interest-free financing to families with stable incomes living 60% below the median income. What this means is if you have a family of four and earn $40,000 a year, you can qualify for a Habitat home. We know there is a need for our services in Topeka because for the first time we have a waiting list of families who are working on their sweat equity hours and our office receives countless calls that we sometimes have to route to partners housing organizations because they are not house ready. We thank the City of Topeka for the recognition of World Habitat Day on October 7th and invite everyone to join us on October 7th at 1816 Southwest Fillmore at 10 a.m. where we can commemorate and raise awareness for our cause. Thank you. City Manager, if we have a proclamation, I, I'm sorry, a presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Ted Mize to, to come to the uh, podium, uh, and he would like to make a presentation pertaining to uh, Topeka and Sioux Care, and I think that I got a little sneak preview. There might be a challenge in this. Mr. Mayor, I have come here tonight to inform you that the volunteers who paint fire hydrants have expressed the need to be identified by a universal name. The name that has received the most accepted is PWC, or Seeking Through Care, which we hope will please both you and the City Council. PWC has two gifts for the City, which we hope will be displayed to the citizens of Seeking. Thank you. This bottle contains marbles removed from paint cans so the cans may be recycled. The second is a very nice pen set, which will be given to the mayor, city manager, or council person that comes closest to the number of marbles that's in the bottle. I will give a sealed number of the marbles to the city clerk, and they can receive submissions from everybody after they get a chance to examine the bottle. PWC hopes you will be entertained by our little contest, and the bottle states, Each marble represents a fire hydrant painted by a dedicated volunteer as a gift to the city of Topeka. There's a pen set, and here's the key. <laughs> Thank you, Ted, for an interesting presentation, and I think we will be following up on the um, on our guesting. And um, maybe by later tonight we can have that decision. Is that uh, I, is that what you're? Pardon me. Yeah. Okay. You want to pass? pass this to, <laughs> maybe you want to roll it around, make it make an estimate. Uh, and we'll have. Uh, I guess maybe we can vote on some portion of the paper we have in front of us and pass it to the city clerk um, at some point at, at later in the evening. Give us a chance. We can do it verbally. Well, that would be, I think we better do it by written, by written document. Maybe we tear off the bottom of the page that says, from the city clerk, that has the people on it, um, the list of, um, I'll just take it, tear off a piece of paper if you have a, a pen, pencil, or writing instrument of some type, and, um, Say more than 50 and less than a million, right? <laughs> and
and be sure to put your name. Or you wouldn't have to put someone else's name. When you've done that, if we pass them to our left, to the city clerk. Yeah, just, just I feel like I read the numbers and see what um, so we. Do you want to name the number? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Councilmember Harmon said two thousand fifty. Which is like Councilmember Schwartz. Do you want to use that right? Three hundred and two. Okay. Councilmember Man Speaker was three hundred forty-five. Councilmember Compass is 434. Councilmember Ortiz is 275. Mayor Wolgas is 450. Councilmember Schmidt is 642. Karen, uh, Councilmember Hiller was 865. Mr. Colson was 386. And the number is 999. So you get the char, I get the char. That's the permit to the city then, to get to the city. All right, we'll find an appropriate place to display it. Mayor, if I could, um, I'm really proud that Ted is from District 1. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've been paying attention as he reports yeah. on how many, yeah. how many fire hydrants he's done. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Ted. We appreciate what you do for the city. Uh, I believe we are. We have no changes or suggestions for the um, consent agenda. We'll proceed with the roll call. Mayor Wolgat? Here. Miller here, Mr. Compass here, Ms. Ortiz here, Ms. Everhart, Ms. De La Isla here, Mr. Mansfield, Ms. Schwartz here, Mr. Schmidt here, Mr. Harmon. Thank you. And then, as I said, there are no uh, adjustments to the consent agenda, so the clerk will read. A is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of Nancy Fidel to the Topeka Human Relations Commission for a term ending August 31, 2015. B is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of Stephanie Mott to the Topeka Human Relations Commission for a term ending August 31, 2015. C is a board appointment recommending the appointment of Mike Padilla to the Topeka Human Relations Commission for an unexpired term ending April 30, 2015. C is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of Mike Morsi to the Topeka Board of Zoning Appeals for a term ending July 31, 2016. B is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of Tim Karkoff to the Topeka Board of Zoning Appeals for a term ending July 31, 2016. F is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of Kevin Beck to the Topeka Planning Commission for a term ending September 30, 2016. G is a board appointment recommending the appointment of Carol Jordan to the Topeka Planning Commission for a term ending September 30, 2016. A for minutes of the regular meeting of September 24, 2013, and there are two applications. We have an open after midnight for Capital Bingo at 2050 Southeast 30th Street, and a dance hall license for JJ's at 435 South Kansas Avenue. Thank you, Council Members. You have heard the uh, consent agenda. It is your pleasure. Ms. Elisa moves to approve the consent agenda. Ms. Miller seconds discussion. All those in favor, vote yes. Opposed, vote no.
Mr. 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 We have eight yes. Eight having voted yes, the consent agenda is uh, approved as read. I'd like to introduce some of our recent appointees. Kevin Beck, the fan, uh, was reappointed to the uh, Planning Commission. He's now serving as chair of the Planning Commission. Uh, Carol Jordan is the appointed to fill a uh, vacancy on the Planning Commission. Uh, Mike Padilla is uh, appointed to fill a vacancy on the Human Relations Commission. Are there other nominees for appointments in the audience? I don't see any uh, that could not attend. Thank you very much for your service. We appreciate your willingness to serve. <laughs> we will proceed with unfinished business. Uh, I demand ordinance on the uh, speaker's view. It is an ordinance introduced by City Manager Jim Colson concerning concessions and admission fees at Speaker Zoo, amending City of Speaker Code sections 1135-010-040-050-060 and 080, and specifically repealing said original sections, sections as well as repealing section 1135-070 final reading. Thank you, Mr. Colson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Wiley, the Zoo Director, to uh, present information to ask and ask any questions. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. During the 2014 budget planning process, the Council reviewed and later approved a cost savings measure by allowing the city to contract out the operation of the zoo's admission and concession functions. During the due diligence process of generating an agreement, it was determined that the relevant ordinance had not been updated to conform to the city manager form of government. The proposed change will accomplish the following things. It updates the ordinance to the city's current form of government, makes zoo fees part of the annual budget process, and allows the city to contract out the admission and concession operations if it falls within the city's best interest to do so. Staff recommends approval. Thank you. Are there um, questions for Mr. Wiley? Ms. Hiller. I have no questions. Move to approve. Okay, uh, Ms. Hiller has moved to approve the ordinance. Uh, Mr. Lee's uh, second. Is there discussion? I'm sorry, Mr. Manson. If you could just explain uh, the financial breakdown to me of having thought to take over the gate. Sure. Uh, in it, what you're asking is a question that is actually separate from the ordinance change, but it does relate. Process of the ordinance change. Well, it, yeah, it's in our minutes or it's in our attached document that this is part of the change. It, it relates to it. The ordinance change allows the operation to be contracted out. That's all it does. It does not stipulate who to. Does that much make sense? Now, the reason why it's a little confusing is. This is kind of coming later in the game uh, as we talk the fact that this ordinance was out of date uh, after the budget meeting, going through the uh, due diligence process. To answer your question, though, uh, there's actually four people that we are planning to transfer to Friends of the Zoo. Uh, it is our concession operation, the admission piece, uh, the event rental piece, and custodial uh, custodial care of public trash cans, public bathrooms, and public lobby. There are two main driving forces behind this. Uh, one is that right now, both organizations employ staff to do the same thing. And by combining them all together, uh, get consistent training. Uh, you can use that staff smarter. Uh, you can have a person, you know, maybe cleaning your grounds in the morning and and uh, selling tickets in the afternoon, as opposed to two different people there doing the same thing. Uh, the other piece of it, when you look at it from a cost savings measure, uh, there are. 
not every day uh, do you need a duplication of process. And the easiest example I can give is, uh, you know, on a cold day in November uh, last year, uh, the city paid a person to work out of the admission booth. Friends of the zoo paid a person to uh, sell gifts in the gift store. Uh, we're trying to capitalize on the opportunity and slow traffic time to put those services together. So the arrangement is uh, we would pay Friends of the Zoo $25,000 uh, up front. And for that fee, uh, they will manage uh, the custodial piece of the public area. Uh, they will administer the admission process. They will uh, operate the concession stand, and they will manage our event planning. Does that, is that along the line of where you see going? Start to answer the question. All right. I, I don't know if you were looking for figures specifically. I have some follow-up questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, and there's one more key piece to that, and that is with the admission revenue that comes through the zoo. Uh, they will handle the admission process. Uh, they will manage that money. 95% of it will go to the general fund. And there will be 5% for uh, essentially providing that service. So if I may, what would 5% of last year's revenue be? Uh, $24,000. Okay. Who currently provides... You stated it so many, many moons ago. I worked in the gift shop at the zoo and spent plenty of lonely Saturdays running the leopard spot. Um, but I'm not quite sure how you could juggle running the gate and running the gift shop. Uh, you wouldn't juggle, per se. Uh, guests would enter through the gift shop. Okay. And so as it stands right now, who is city staff that is manning the front gate? Correct. And it's city staff that is doing janitorial service, or the or zookeepers doing that? Uh, uh, the city staff, public works. Okay. And so the assumption would be that all of those city staff have provided health insurance and caper's retirement benefits, am I correct? Uh, some are temp, and one person does receive uh, caper's full benefits. So it would be one at the position that you'd be abolishing? Uh, this actually allows us to reduce by two. Two. That's all I have. Thanks. I think in the um, in the material, I think maybe as you're, you're referring to for tonight, it, it said that the pr proposed ordinance change would accomplish updating the ordinance, making zoo fees part of the annual budget process, and allowing the zoo to contract out the oper admission operation. It falls within the best interest of the city. So I think that gives us that overview. Are there other questions for Mr. Wyvern? Yeah. Mr. Wyvern. Brendan, um, first off, the Zubilee was awesome. And the auction, I visited the auction this year. Had never, you know, done that. I, we need to get the word out more because there were some really awesome things on there. So, congrats to both of those things. But this realization of savings of 120000 then that is, is that, the com is that just in salaries we're saving, or is there any? No, uh, it is in salaries and merchandise that normally we would purchase and sell. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Council. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just curious, when it comes to the concessions, we will be doing a fair uh, request for a proposal now. Uh, the uh, purchasing department did review that and chose to full source this, and there's somebody that could potentially speak to this better than me. The reason why this is a win-win in this situation and most likely nobody else could compete is because Friends of the Zoo already operates 
out of the facility. They incur no additional charges to do that. They have a current management structure already in place. Uh, this doesn't incur any additional costs. And uh, they are a nonprofit uh, that's not, per se, driven by uh, profit making goals. I mean, we want them to be successful because that money goes directly back into the city. But uh, this model isn't, it's not a capitalistic type model. It's a set it up so that one organization reduces its costs uh, while the other um, uses the same assets to do more. No, I appreciate that answer. It didn't answer my question. Um, are we going to have open RFPs for concessions? No. That is not the plan today. Questions, Mr. Wiley. We have one person who is signed to uh, speak on this item, um, Joseph Redbetter. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. Good morning, Bobby. Uh, in 2005, uh, we had a volunteer group put together, uh, appointed by various council people. I was on that. And we, the zoo had some serious issues going on at that time, and it took about three years to resolve most of them. Uh, <clears throat> we made recommendations back then. So when I saw this, I said, well, this is interesting. And I, I so I did call uh, the director today. I had some questions for him. Uh, the concessions, we, we recommended eight years ago that they go to Friends of Zoo and save the city uh, quite a bit of money. Uh, that's one part of this that I have no problem with. I, I do have a problem with one of the items, and I'll discuss that further. Um, the uh, at that time, friends of Zeus said they didn't want to run it. They thought it would cost them money. And <clears throat> when I was looking at their books and looking at what they got for uh, selling memberships, I said, "Well, we need something back from friends of Zoo for your privilege of selling the." Uh, the memberships, and they were doing some things, but what I liked about this plan, the part I did like, was that Friends of Zoo seemed to be willing to uh, uh, come up to speed and actually participate more in things that would save the city money versus just making money and paying their salaries and running a gift shop and then providing, uh, you know, some money for some traveling exhibits and some things that were a little more incidental in cost. And so that part, you know, I like. We, we made other recommendations back then, too, like uh, there was a construction manager. We, we didn't see why we were paying for that, and they eventually did eliminate that position. Um, the, the part that troubles me a little bit is giving up the gate. Now, I was talking to uh, the director today, and he said that's uh, $480,000. <clears throat> and it, it was not that high in 05. I mean, it's come up some. But that is uh, probably a tremendous amount of cash to just hand over to a third party if you don't have a lot of control. Uh, the question I was wondering was, is that going to be handled by volunteers? Uh, are they going to be able to change the hours of the zoo because they run the gate? Uh, you know, will they staff it fully as it is now, or will it, they uh, cut hours back if uh, they don't think they're making enough money as a uh, nonprofit? Uh, I had a couple questions about the concession, too. I said, are they going to be open at least six months out of the year, or have you even discussed, you know, uh, that as part of a contract? He said the contract wasn't done yet, but... I said, I understand. I said, there's just some things you want. You want some controls. I mean, are they just going to sell ice cream and pop and that's it? Or are they going to keep a few things out there that people want? So, I mean, those are just things that cross my mind. But I, I guess the thing that uh, 
I was concerned with the most was most of this looks fine to me. Uh, transferring concessions, event rentals, custodian expenses, that's all fine. That causes Fox to do more for what they're entitled to do, which is sell those, uh, you know, basic gate passes, those, those family passes. But the problem is, uh, who's controlling all that cash? And you have people that, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, just trust to entrust with that much money. I'm going to ask for more time. Welcome to this time. Please move to extend the time. Motion to extend three minutes, please. Three minutes, please. Three <coughs> seconds. All those in favor vote yes. Those vote no. Yes. Eight having voted yes, we continue. <coughs> Thank you. Um, <coughs> on the on the admission, so as I said, you know, one of the concerns I asked was, well, could they change the gate hours since they're basically controlling uh, the uh, cash deposits? You know, can they, uh, you know, address that? Uh, the other thing is, uh, <coughs> what kind of controls do you have in place for that much? Because a lot of it is cash. I mean, I understand a lot of it's debit cards and things. But uh, anytime you have cash, you want to go, wow, you know, uh, we just want to make sure somebody doesn't have a gambling problem that's handling money. Uh, those are the kinds of things you look at. And I didn't know if those were even thought about. Uh, I'm sure the Friends of Zoom means well. I'm sure they'll do well. I just think that these are the times you ask the questions is when you are putting together a contract or changing uh, something that, uh, you know, passes that much control to another uh, entity. Uh, as far as on really, really slow days in the winter, letting people go through uh, the concession, I mean, I'm sorry, not the concession, but the uh, gate, uh, I've seen that at a couple zoos. It's not that out of the norm. Uh, the Salina Zoo does. I've seen that some other smaller zoos, uh, you know, do that in the winter. <coughs> But, I mean, I think the concept's right, and uh, I just uh, have those concerns that I've voiced on the record, and, uh, uh, again, saying that uh, some of these ideas, uh, sometimes, you know, people in the community have already thought of them, and then it takes another eight years to get to, uh, you know, the process. But, uh, anyway, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Redbatter, for your comments and suggestions and recommendations. I'm sure many of those we are oh, they're aware of we take into consideration. Uh, there, is there any other comments, questions? We have the uh, ordinance before us. It's been uh, moved and seconded. There's no other discussion. All those in favor vote yes. Opposed vote no. <coughs> we have seven yes. Mr. Mann, speaker, ready now. Seven having voted yes, the ordinance is passed and approved. Uh, item B of unfitting business is the ordinance on the West Star franchise. B is an ordinance introduced by City Manager Jim Colson, granting to West Star Energy Incorporated an electric franchise, including the right to construct, operate, and maintain electric transmission, distribution, and street lighting facilities within the corporate limits of the City of Topeka, Kansas, and specifically repelling ordinance number 18297. Final reading. Mr. Colson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to ask Mary Feeney, uh, Deputy City Attorney. Chad Sublet, the City Attorney, will come back <laughs> And I'm going to change my book right now. Thank you, Mr. Sublet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this was an issue that was brought up during the um, Budget Committee hearings uh, to increase the franchise fee by 1%. Essentially, what's before you, um, this ordinance doesn't change the franchise termination provi provisions, the city can terminate only if West Star doesn't comply with the franchise agreement and doesn't cure the default within 90 days. Uh, the 1% uh, increase would go into effect essentially 30 days after it was, if it would be passed by this body, so it could go into effect November 1st, 2013. And um, I would just ask, I know finance had sent some numbers, if you want to comment on what those increases would be or I can. Right now, we're low bond investment. Uh, we think it'll be about 600000 per year for the 1%. Um, in 12, we took in $7.3 million in uh, West Star franchise fee. 
in 2011, we took in a little over seven million. In 2010, we took in 6.7 million dollars. So, if we did a straight one percent, it would be a little bit more than 600,000. But we're trying to uh, estimate our revenues on the low side. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments um, to the council, Mr. Conkle. I appreciate the information from staff, but this is not something that I'm willing to support. It is, in fact, a direct, or excuse me, an indirect tax that is passed on to every single one of the residents in the city of Topeka. And, you know, if you come onto the east side of Topeka and southeast part of the city, you will see transformers that are rusted out. We need some significant upgrades in the um, equipment that Westar is using. I can't support this franchise fees knowing that people in my district and throughout the city are going to pay a higher rate, not only with the increase in utility rates, but also an increase in the franchise fees that we're trying to pass forward here. So I would implore my colleagues to look forward to the next year in um, the franchise rebate program, which is something I will be bringing forth to this, to this body. We do have to change it in light of the state statute that um, changed over the Homestead Act, which is no longer applicable to renters throughout the state but we can make amendments to our rebate program so that renters can receive some of this franchise money back for those who live on modest income, not paycheck to paycheck. So I will not be supporting this, and I implore my colleagues to take an in-depth look at this. Thank you. Other questions, comments? We have two persons who have, um, we'll perhaps we'll go to those next um, before we take action. Uh, to have signed up to speak to the issue, and then first is Kelsey Williams. Ms. Williams. Good evening. I'm Kelsey Williams here on behalf of Westar Energy. Um, in summary, this is just uh, a typical operation that we do with all of our cities, um, and they're open for renegotiation in certain terms listed within the franchise. The only thing changing in this is in response to a request from the city to change it from 5% to 6%. So, and as I understand, then, actually, as this document shows, it is really a new document. I mean, we have... It is. In there is one, we sort of brought everything into it, but as council members, as you've seen, there are no strikeouts or anything, so it's, a, it's really a new agreement between Westar and the city. One of the few changes um, we made, which... Uh, could help us be able to do our job a little bit better is, uh, let me find what page that's on, uh, page six of the ordinance, is under section five, um, the company, which is Westar, shall not be required to obtain an excavation permit for poles located in the right-of-way or utility easement provided the company attends and participates in the utility coordination committee meetings, which we do. Um, this just kind of prevents some regulatory lag in us being able to do our job. Someone knocks over a pole or there's a, a storm. This allows us to go ahead and replace it without having to wait on a permit. Okay. Are there questions for uh, Ms. Williams? Yeah, Ms. Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> in our document here, it says that it'll increase annual revenue by an additional 600000 from West Star from the fees. When does, the, when does Westar then get to pass that along to consumers? Um, th this is for gross receipts submitted monthly to the city. So this is not an additional cost to Westar? No, this is in essence just what we withhold from gross receipts to occupy utility easements and right of way that is remitted back to the city. So the 5% to 6% increase is coming from where? gross receipts of utility bills. It does not include disconnect fees, late fees, anything like that. Just gross utility uh, receipts of actual bills within the city limits, the corporate city limits. So Westar will be making less than less the 600000 as Pam said. In, in essence, Westar's not making any more or less. We obtain this money for the city for use of the right-of-way and the utility easements and remit it monthly, all of it back to the city. So that's how it's increasing city revenue, is by collecting more and remitting it back. And no cost to consumers. Yeah. Well, yeah. it is going to cost consumers, but it's not going in Westar's pocket. Okay. Thank you. 
it's like an additional fee that will be you will see on your bill each month. It has on there, I think, excise fee or something as one of the listed franchise fee. Franchise fee is listed and it's the amount, and that will be increasing. Yes. By this, by this amount. But ultimately, this is nothing that goes in West Coast. This that's is something right. that's remitted that's right back to the state. Going, yes. Are there other questions, council members, Mr. Campos? Thank you for your presentation. I'm curious to know um, what type of comprehensive um, overview do you have of the grid system in the city, and can you provide that to this council so we see which transmitters are up to date, where uh, infrastructure is lacking and needs to be replaced. Like I had mentioned in my presentation, there are rusted transformers all across 29th and California Street. We get somewhat of a thunderstorm and no lightning or rain. We have half of Oakland gets knocked out of electricity. So how are you going in the future to accommodate the city and the, and thus the payers? Uh, I'm, if I, I think well, if you want to make that as a request, it, it, would, or, or, it would be a definitely a problem to do. But right, we're reviewing this ordinance is dealing with the franchise fee, and I think our remarks discussion should be pertaining to that. Well, it's part, it's part of the discussion, Mr. Mayor. And, of course, it's rhetorical. I don't expect a response from me. But if you could provide that to this body, I'd appreciate it. Well, and just to touch on an aspect of that, this is not a fee that we are putting towards our infrastructure. It is to pay for the use of right-of-ways and utility easements, which we put right back to the city. We remit them. Our right. infrastructure... Is, is completely unrelated. It's the use of right-of-ways and utility easements. I understand that. It's an indirect tax that goes to every consumer in the city of Topeka administered through Westar. So it is a line item, um, Councilwoman Schwartz, that each person pays in the city. And we only do it for water. We do it for gas. We do it for electricity. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I think, actually, as far as the level of service, that's de it's really dealt by the Corporation Commission. Correct. We're a regulated utility. Regulated and utility. Everything so is if there are issues pertaining to the proper receipt of the electricity through parts of the city, it's really an issue for the Corporation Commission. And that's really where the issue should be taken, rather this council has, has actually no jurisdiction over how rates or the power is provided in the city. Correct. And, and as, as we say, I mean, we strive our best to give the best, most reliable, efficient, and affordable energy to all customers, but that's really not of the nature here. This is just as a franchise fee. This is your lead spot. At, um, at some point during our budget sessions, we were discussing what the impact of this change would be on our homeowners, and we had estimated that it was going to be 15 cents on average. So I just want to make sure that we, and, and I don't recall exactly how we came up with the math, but um, we had talked about that this was only going to be a 15 cent increase for the homeowners a month. A month. Mm -hmm. okay. so I'd to bring that up. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, you can see who pays the bills in our house. It's not me, and I don't look at the, the fees that are on the utility bills. But this is a, an increase, a 1% increase. And I believe that um, our city's residents do not need to have another increase. Okay. Uh, is, this, is there other questions for Ms. Williams? I just wanted to, uh, I know when we talked about this uh, um, in budget over the summer, people were very stressed about how to handle needed revenue for our budget and didn't want to raise property taxes, really debated whether to increase this. And Part of whether it work, would work had to do with whether Westar would be responsive and turn right around and get this done. And I just wanted to thank you for your cooperation and responding to our request. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, we have another person to um, sign to speak. That's Mr. Lane. Thank you, Mr. Good evening, governing body. Uh, well, I spoke my opposition during the budget, so no sense repeating that. It's, it's already on the record. Uh, small businesses and homeowners of this town cannot continue to take increases uh, on anything. Uh, this is a 20% increase in the fee, and 
it uh, does come right off the bill of every homeowner and every small business uh, in this uh, community, every church, uh, anybody that pays a uh, electric bill. Uh, I did have a couple just kind of concerns, I thought. First off, uh, it takes 30 days to implement this, and uh, why not just line it up for January 1st, make it at the beginning of the year? Why do we need an extra two, two uh, months worth of this fee this year? Uh, the second thing was, <clears throat> do you really have to set these up for 20 years at a time? I mean, it might be that future councils might want to lower it. Uh, maybe you should do it for 10 years. Uh, I, uh, I haven't had a chance to really do a lot of legal research on franchise fees, but uh, I do know the city was involved in a franchise fee case with the Supreme, went all the way to Supreme Court back in uh, 72, and uh, one of the things, and I'm not saying this, this particular ordinance is hanging out because I, I just have not had time to look at it, and I'll just say it's probably fine, you know, but I'm just saying I looked at this earlier case, and basically the whole of that case in 72 about franchise fees was with a cable company. Uh, so the city did have authority to enact an ordinance uh, for uh, franchise fees, for that uh, cable franchise, but also held that uh, uh, the system, uh, that the fee exacted by the city for administering the system was far beyond what was reasonably or necessarily for uh, regulatory purposes and uh, therefore was ruled unreasonable in its size. And I'm not saying that applies to this because it's my understanding this all goes to general fund. <clears throat> my problem with some of these things that are brought before the council is uh, we talk about saving property taxes, which is laudable. I mean, that's, that's good. But then you raise sales taxes to the stratosphere, where we're the highest in the state. The poor cannot afford those either. Uh, the small businesses can't afford them. Uh, or you come up with, uh, you know, uh, we have enterprise funds, and I've already questioned one of those on the record, and I'm not going to go into that tonight. But... You have to be careful that you just can't continue to push these other fees and rates and charges out there, hoping that you can avoid the central issue of what is driving the cost of the city, and that is cost. We don't need more taxes. We don't need higher rates. We need to control our costs. That includes overtime for exempt employees that shouldn't be paid it, overtime, for some of these utility workers that uh, are out on weekends and on non-emergencies. I'm going to talk about that in public comments. Uh, we've got to get to the heart of the matter, and that's control the cost, and quit just expecting the homeowners and business owners to just pay and pay and pay and keep increasing and increasing fees and rates and taxes. So anyway, those are some concerns. Uh, thank you for uh, hearing me. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, one other point I think well, well, I, that was made during the budget time when we were considering this is this is a tax on consumption or however you want to see, franchise fee, and it is something that the um, governmental entities pay. So when we talk about payment in lieu of taxes, this is something the uh, governmental entities, for, for instance, the state, they would be paying this franchise fee into the city for all this, the uh, power used by state offices in the community. So that's one aspect of sort of offsetting some of the other costs that is only on the residents, which is the property taxes. Uh, we do not have an, a, um, a motion or action on this. Council, you have your... Mr. Harmon? Thank you, Your Honor. I'll move to adopt the ordinance. Mr. Harmon moves to adopt the ordinance. Is there a second? Mr. Spor uh, Mr. Second. Is there a discussion? All those in favor? I'm sorry, Mr. Manson. I'm oh, sorry. Um, just real quickly, I, you know, because of my work, I work closely with folks at West Star. I don't receive any compensation, so I can vote on this from West Star. But, uh, the reality is, is that Westar provides an incredibly cheap product to its consumers. I know that to be a fact when I've gone around to rural electric cooperatives and seen the rates that those folks pay. We're really on below par for, for what other folks are paying in the state of Kansas. 
That is not an endorsement of their current uh, rate hike, but I'm just throwing that out there as information. And just as an aside, um, as of April 3rd, 2013, uh, Westar had $150 million in projects planned in the city of Topeka, one being a, a major transmission line going to the new substation, which is uh, south of uh, I-70, and then the other being uh, 15 other projects totaling $150 million. They also, uh, if you've seen the, the right tree service trucks out there, trimming the trees for more reliability. They use the term reliability tree. Um, to make sure the power stays on when the wind kicks up and, and we're able to keep service going. I know when I talked with uh, the CEO at one point, you know, the main goal of the power company is that we're able to pay for the power that they want to sell us. And so it's key to them to keep their infrastructure up and maintained. Thank you. Thank you. Are there comments or discussions? If not, all those in favor vote yes. Those opposed vote no. I vote yes. Your yes, Mayor. We have seven yes. Seven. Seven, yeah. seven having voted yes, the ordinance is approved. Going to item C, the allocation of youth and service grants. C is adoption of the committee report from the Economic and Community Development Committee. Committee meeting of September 23rd, 2013, concerning the review and allocation recommendations for 2014 Youth and Social Service Grants. I recognize Councilwoman Hiller, who will give the committee report. Well, we gave that last week. I'll keep it very brief. You all have a handout that looks like this, and the recommendations are below the bar. Midway, the, the two blue columns, the uh, recommendation of the Economic and Community Development Committee was to allocate both for general fund and for CDBG at 2013 levels, and those are the numbers we have you, you have before you. Move to approve. Okay, the committee's report is received. Um, actually, by Robert's rules, we don't need to approve it. It is, it is received to the to the um, I'm sorry. to the group. The, this, you want to move. This, this group needs to approve those allocations, That's that correct. allocation recommendation. That's correct. Okay. And so, um, Councilman Hiller is moving in accordance with the committee's recommendations right. uh, that she's moving at the social use and social service grants be allocated at the same levels as 2013. Um, Mr. Smith seconds. Is there discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor vote yes, opposed vote no. We have eight yes. Eight having voted yes, the applications are approved. Um, Stating to new business, um, A is expenditures ordinance. A is an ordinance introduced by City Manager Jim Colson, allowing and approving city expenditures for the period of July 27, 2013 through August 30, 2013, and enumerating city expenditures there in first and final reading. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, approval would authorize operating expenditures in the amount of $17,722,736.84, and we're asking uh, for that approval. I will just say that as part of my comments, I know there's been a lot of discussion about uh, reporting and everything. We're finishing up the September numbers. September numbers right now? Yeah, thank you. And uh, it is our expectation that we will present uh, the new reporting structure that will allow you to see both on a monthly basis and also a, a quarterly basis that has more detail. So we have, been, we have been responsive to the conversation that occurs here, and we think that you'll be pleased when we bring it to you, which will be very soon as soon as we finish this report. Thank you. Good. Good to hear that. Uh, your thoughts on this ordinance? Yes, been moved by Mrs. Ortiz and seconded by Mr. Schwartz to approve the ordinance on expenditures. All those in favor vote yes. Opposed vote no. We have seven yes. Mr. Compos voting no. Seven having voted yes, the ordinance is approved. I don't believe there are any applications this evening. There are no first readings, so we will proceed to presentations. Mr. 
City Manager. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council. I just really wanted to very quickly talk about uh, the uh, neighborhood relations position that was introduced last week, and uh, uh, Darren Scott uh, stepped into that position. Uh, very exciting. Uh, I think he has a unique set of skills. He understands the city, understands the neighborhoods. We're working very diligently to address many of the code issues and the code enforcement issues, how we how we do it, what the code looks like, and, and many other issues associated with that. We plan on coming back to you very quickly um, with our with our plan to address many, many issues. So, and once again, I, I think we've been kind of quiet in the last couple of weeks, but I want you to know that staff's been diligently working on many items that were discussed uh, during and throughout the budget process. That concludes my comments. Thank you. I want to uh, comment briefly on that um, uh, Council Member Smith and I attended the Intercity trip that the uh, Chamber of Topeka organizes, and we uh, were in Fargo, North Dakota, a uh, metropolitan area of about 210,000 of Fargo, Moorhead, Minnesota, and West Fargo, very similar to Topeka. Uh, just two points uh, that I would make of the, of the learning process. Number one is what they're doing in their neighborhood. They have the most, the, by far, one of the most forward-looking processes of dealing with issues within neighborhoods. The entire city is composed of neighborhood associations, having goals. Uh, they have a program to help their neighborhood uh, improve their structure. So that was very exciting to hear. And also, then they have an outstanding program for entrepreneurs young people, entrepreneur programs, supporting them, helping them develop their own processes, and the success that is there is unbelievable. Uh, the major problem in this community is they can't find enough people for their jobs. Their, their economy is growing so rapidly, they have difficulty in being able to provide all the needed people in their, in their industries and organizations. So it's very exciting, uh, very, sim very similar to Pika, in Topeka in many ways. Okay, and with that, I will proceed. Mr. Harmon, and Mrs. Hiller. Real quickly, uh, it's been a busy week for me. I have had a lot of street, alley, and sidewalk constituent issues. Um, kind of swamped with them. There have been both half cent sales tax and other uh, sources. I just wanted to say I appreciate the staff assistance. We have been able to work through pretty much all of them in pretty short order, and that's not easy. I also. Um, co-presented with our bike ways coordinator, Julie Anderson, at the Built Environment and Outdoors conference this week. Topeka hosted that conference. Um, there were others from Topeka that presented at other sessions as well. I just wanted to share with all of you that we, we co-presented with Wichita. It went well. It was well received. My part was to talk about the strong citizen participation, engagement, and involvement in our bike ways development. Um, it, was, it was great to present that. At the same time, we've got a long way to go. Scott uh, Waddle from Wichita just says, so we're having a friendly competition, huh? They are way out there, as are other cities in the state with their bike waste development. I also wanted to, um, many of you saw the photo, but my colleague John Compost and I got out on the river with, as the governor and a group of about 100 people floated from Wamigo, canoed or kayaked from Wamigo to Bellevue to open up the new boat ramp at Bellevue. They're now up to, I believe it's 19 boat ramps on the river between Junction City and Kansas City. It is really opening up steadily for recreation. It was fun, and it, it made it even more compelling to see if we could get the section here through Topeka open and open safely. And last, I want to thank my colleague, Councilwoman Schwartz. She invited me to join her for coffee and conversation at a coffee house in with people from her district last week. It was well attended. It was a lot of fun and uh, a good model for all of us to think about doing more of. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend some kind of congratulations to Amber, who is yeah. assistant to Ginny in the council office. She just had a baby girl, right? Yeah, just had a baby girl a few days ago. Congratulations to you and your family. Uh, to uh, follow up on what Councilwoman Hiller was saying, uh, it was nice to go out onto the river with the governor and speak about an um, unleveraged asset that we have here in the city and in the state. Uh, if you come to District 1 and to District 2, we'd be happy to take you around the river at some time, even put you in a kayak, and hopefully you don't make your way down to Lawrence too fast. But uh, nonetheless, it, it is a, a vital asset for us to recognize 
Uh, people always fish. There are points in the river where uh, you can just walk straight across the sandbars and, you know, not be in much trouble with undercurrents. The perception of the river is that it's dangerous. You know, there's a folklore that kind of goes through my community, and I've grown up with it, that we stay away from the river. And I think we uh, need to position ourselves, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to actually open that up. It is a vital place for recreation. Uh, I do want to invite people out. We do have kids night this Saturday at Garfield Community Center. I will be uh, working with the uh, Community Foundation to be showing Toy Story 3 starting at 7.15 this Saturday. Also, we do have a movie on the lawn on the south part of the Capitol. I believe it's Goonies or City Slippers. I don't know which one it is. Goonies. Hey, you guys. And lastly, uh, eh, never mind. That's, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Ortiz. Well, I was just going to announce that Goonies is playing at the Capitol 730. Bring your own lawn chair or your blankets. And um, I didn't know about Toy Story. So they're both free. And I guess I have to flip a coin. And um, now, which, night, which night is that at the Capitol? It's Saturday it's night. Sat are they both Saturday? Mm -hmm, they're both Saturday. Um, they, they did that because people want to go out on the lawn and go to the movies. And they used to have them on Thursday nights, and people were kind of complaining. But I tell you, there's been a lot of a lot of families um, doing this, and it's, it's just rather awesome. So if you get a chance, it's awesome. Place to be. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Mr. Mass Speaker. I would just note that it's been 47 days since we found out that the fire department was receiving overtime and supervision positions, and that practice has not ceased yet. Thank you. George. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First, I want to announce on Thursday it is Jumpstart 3 for the record, and I'll be at Bishop Elementary reading to the kindergarten class the book Otis. And here's Otis, and I'll leave that with the, the class. Um, you can get a digital version of this at wegivebooks.org. It's free to the public, and their whole purpose is to try to get as many people reading to kids as possible on the, on the same day. Um, millions will be, I guess they've been on the Today Show and they will. So let's all read to our kids on October 3rd. Um, the other thing is that we have Apple Festival this weekend on, on, the, on the 6th on Sunday and I'll be working out there at the festival at the Ward Mead, um, with the Ward Mead Park um, Gardeners Club. So, thank you. Thank you. Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I will also be reading Otis to Wanamaker Elementary on Thursday, so I encourage everybody to get involved with that program. Um, I wanted to send out congratulations to the undefeated Washburn football team who won this weekend as well, um, and to express gratitude to Brendan for the Zubilee this weekend, which was, I thought, a fabulous success. Um, and to further on um, the mayor's point from our trip to Fargo, um, I wanted to, to touch on that. You talked about the entrepreneurial spirit that that's within that city. Um, I think it was remarkable to see what a revitalized downtown does to a city, the energy that it brings, the young entrepreneurs that were there. It was a, it was a rather amazing display of public-private partnership in education and training. It's left them with a job situation where they have staggering 3% unemployment, which is virtually no unemployment, and they're actually have, they have 6,000 jobs open that they cannot fill right now, um, which I think is, is a, an important or a nice goal for us to have. Uh, some of the things that, that the young entrepreneurs that we got to meet with talked about um, were the, the ideas of livability. Um, that's what, what allows them to retain and to attract young talent uh, to their city. It was, it was remarkably impressive and it, it was interesting to see um, how important the idea of livability, of having a thriving downtown, of having extraordinary neighborhoods, uh, neighborhood associations, a sense of community, and a sense of civic pride was um, to, the, to, the, to the great um, economic environment um, that they had going on there. It was a great trip and I will give you further details in a report later, at a later date, but Thank you. Thank you.
We have three persons who have indicated uh, they want to speak in public comment. The first is David Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, please. Hi there. I'll come here to say that um, something came to my attention that needs to be addressed, which is that of our public waters. And um, I talked to uh, the public water system, and it told me that they're adding fluoride to our public waters, which people drink on a daily basis. And I found that troubling because I did some research on that, and fluoride, which is people say that it's good for you because it's good for um, dental cavities and such, like to prevent any um, dental problems and such. But after doing some research, it has come to my attention that attention that it has many negative effects that has not been, you know, talked to the people about. And so I'm going to read a little bit about what uh, my research has, you know, shown. As of May 2013, the total for three studies have investigated the relationship between fluoride and human intelligence. Of these investigations, third stem of 43 human studies have found elevated fluoride exposure is associated with reduced IQ. Now, out of these 43 studies, Harvard scientists reviewed 27 of these. And I have come to the conclusion that it is a high research priority, which means that we need to have more research into the effects of fluoride upon our, upon human consumption. And after much more, you know, study, they have come to the conclusion that fluoride has, indeed has an effect on a, child, a child's neurodevelopment, which means that um, fluoride over, ingested over a long period of time does decrease a child's IQ by eight points. And not just that, but... Um, People see fluoride as a form of medication, but what's troubling to me is why is it being, you know, put into the public waters? Do people not have a right to decide that they want fluoride in their water, so do they not have the option of choice to choose, you know, to be able to drink water that's regularly available, you know, just free of fluoride, instead of having to buy bottled waters, you know? And also, um, there's also more research has shown that, um, the Food and Drug Administration say the fluoride is a drug, not a nutrient when used to prevent disease. And so, by definition, fluoridation of the water is a form of medication, which brings up a moral, you know, question is, well, <coughs> is why are we medicating people without their consent? And um, most of Western Europe, uh, nations that reject the practice of fluoridation are waters, public waters. And 97% of Western Europeans do not drink water that is fluoridated. Instead, they ban that practice of uh, putting fluoride into our waters. And 90% of both the UK and Spain also uh, um, do not follow that practice. And proponents for fluoride, they state that fluoridating the water lowers tooth decay. However, research has shown that the tooth decay has declined in all Western countries, not just you know, the United States or Canada, but it also shows that. Um, it has, it has this climb because, you know, proper, you know, tooth care, you know, using toothpaste and such going to the dentist, not because we put fluoride into our water systems. And that has been um, that's from a study of uh, WHO, which is the World Health Organization. And also, uh, fluoride and just over long periods of time have correlated with a range of serious effects, including arthritis, damage to the development brain, reduced thyroid functions, which is uh, considered the Adam's apple, which where is it? Oh, wrong one. There we go. Which regulates the body me uh, metabolism rate and plays an important role in the human health for all, met for all metabolism. Active cells are regulated by the thyroid. And also um, increases the chance of um, osteosarcoma, which is um, a form of bone cancer, which affects tissues that support uh, parts of the body, fat, bone, and muscle cells. Conclude your remarks. Uh, yes, please. If I can have at least two more minutes, if possible. Motion to extend. Second. Uh, Mr. Land Speaker's moved to extend for two minutes. Mr. Koppel seconds. All Thank those in favor, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. We have a yes. So you having voted yes, please continue for two minutes. All right, and the fluoride is added to the, our water systems. It's not naturally occurring. Instead, it's known as fluorosilic acid. It is the corrosive acid capture in the air pollution control devices of the phosphate fertilizing industry, which includes a higher risk of cancer hazards and acid elevated arsenic content. 
and neurotoxic has from the acid ability to increase erosion of lead from old house pipes. And to make the matter worse, fluoride, the fluoride that's added to our public waters is not, it does not go under any purification process, which is troubling in itself. And fluoride um, main benefit does not come from being ingested or drank. Instead, um, the main benefit comes from being applied in a topical manner, such as toothbrush. And once fluoride is put into the water, it is virtually impossible to control the dose for each individual who drinks um, out, of uh, out of public water, tap water. Because people take different amounts of water, especially people who work out in the sun, manual labor, and athletes. And fluoride accumulates in the body. Healthy adults' kidney is 50 to 60 percent of fluoride ingested each day. The remainder accumulates in the body, largely in calcified tissues such as the bone and the pineal gland, which is responsible for the synthesis and secretion of the hormone melatonin, which regulates onset of puberty in females and helps protect the body from cell damage caused by free radicals. And so, one of my questions is, um, what, do, what do we need to do, you know, to um, stop the process of putting fluoride into our waters, drinking waters, of course. So this is a time when you make a presentation. It isn't a time of question and answer. If you have a copy of your of your presentation, that we could have that. That would be helpful. Oh, I, do not have find, of, me? I do not have one at the moment, but if possible, I can send an email to each of you guys. That would be fine. If you can send the material to us, that would be fine. Now, I agree. Yeah. Is there any chance, like, um, would I need to start a petition or something like that? Get signatures? Okay. Why don't you check with the legal department after the meeting? This is the time to just make a presentation. All right. We don't to provide information back and forth here. Okay. All right. That All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your presentation. Time. Thank you. The second person to speak is Mr. Ted Mize. Mr. Mayor, City Manager, Council Persons, you know my name is Ted Mize, and I live in Central Topeka. I apologize at my appearance tonight, but I came directly from the streets of Topeka, working to improve the looks and safety of the city. In fact, I've taken care of about 18 fire hydrants in the last two days. I am still asking for your help in contacting persons that are willing to contribute to the community, and this is a continuing goal. Uh, what I have sitting here is a project bag that I issued to volunteers. It contains paint, spray handles, scraper, wire brush, broom, well, the broom's sitting over there, a masking tape, and cover material, and a map. I give detailed uh, instructions. I give detailed instructions to my volunteers, and we are part of the fire protection program of the city. I've been told by groups once involved in this type of volunteer service gives a person satisfaction because there is a visual result for the community. The groups are given a choice of the area in Topeka on which they work, and I speak to the listeners tonight who might be interested to contact me or any city agency, and we will work with you. We should remember that the beauty and safety of Topeka is the responsibility of all of us. And one added a little thing that I've run on to, and I think we really need an ordinance, but I don't think we have one, is that unfortunately there are some people that like to plant stuff around fire hydrants. Uh, this makes them, number one, kind of accessible, and as the project I happen to be working on, I had to hunt for the fire hydrant. I knew where it was because of the map, but the fire department doesn't carry them, and we really ought to have something that says that uh, the visual obstruction to a fire hydrant should be illegal. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Mai, for your presentation. The third person is uh, Mr. Joseph Ledbetter. Governing body. <coughs> Well, I was just thinking about that problem Ted just posed, and I thought maybe if there were more dog horses, they would take care of those fire hydrants. I was glad to see Ted return the marbles that I know have been missing from City Hall for many years. Wow. 
that went over good. <coughs> uh, I'm talking about before y'all got here, of course. Uh, I had a concern. I raised this with the uh, manager's office. He did deal with it. Uh, I turned in, uh, I'm, well, let me just start this again. On uh, Labor Day, 8 o'clock, uh, I was in town picking up something, and I noticed a city vehicle, dump truck, empty, traveling pretty fast, on 37th and Burlingame. And I said, that's interesting. And uh, so I turned that in. I said, why do we have city employees working overtime on Labor Day since we seem to have a serious overtime problem in our budgets? Uh, I was told, uh, talked to uh, Doug in charge of public works later, that uh, that, in fact, was a non-emergency uh, event. And uh, so I thought, I wonder how often that happens because I've seen it more than once over the years. I've seen, uh, I'm not going to go into all the details, but I have turned some of these in in the past. And what happens is over time, that over time gets added to pensions, which makes those pensions even better. And uh, I'm just pointing out, I think we've got a problem. And I think it needs to be dealt with before the next budget. Uh, I looked back at some articles said that uh, the water department had run up a million dollars worth of uh, overtime this last spring. Uh, I remembered a conversation from a consultant that was here. Uh, never saw his report for the city, but I did go down to Wichita and see what he reported there. I figured it would be kind of the same whenever he presented up here. But he said something very interesting at the library uh, last spring. He said that uh, he had found that... Uh, uh, on numerous occasions, city employees had, uh, in their testing or flushing of lines, were breaking the lines. And he told them they needed to uh, lower the uh, pressure that they were cleaning them out with. Uh, you wonder how many breaks were because of that, and then it went to overtime. Uh, I'm sure none of that uh, is deliberate, but when you talk about the kind of cost and budget problems this city's got, you have got to start looking at overtime. Private, the private sector does. And uh, actually, the, uh, the postal system is doing a lot of studying about how to cut their overtime right now. And, uh, and they're doing it. And so there's a quasi-governmental agency that's paying attention to it. So I believe that governments absolutely have to look at these things and deal with them. Uh, I was also out uh, just doing riding my mountain bike around Forbes over the Labor Day weekend, and I did about seven miles out there. And I went up on the north end and saw how many empty warehouses we now have uh, that used to be full of jobs. And I'm talking about just a couple of years ago. Uh, and I was wondering where was Go to Peak on that? Maybe they were at Fargo. Maybe they were uh, at Fort Collins, Colorado last year when we lost uh, Hallmarks. Uh, I didn't know where they were, but uh, it was about 10% of those buildings were full on that north end. And they used to all be full. And it wasn't that long ago. Uh, I would uh, ask for an extension of time. Most for extend how long do you need? Two minutes. Most for extend for two minutes. Mr. Madam Speaker moves to extend for two minutes. At least for a second discussion. I was in favor of vote yes. Opposed to vote no. Yes. yes, thank you. Uh, it's really past time for us to start dealing with economic development and that contract that Go to Peak has and their contracts coming up again. And it's time for the public to be allowed to comment at length about how to deal with their problems or our problems, which are and how they are not dealing with the economic woes that this city is facing. It's time for the public to be allowed to speak at length. As long as they do, we need to be able to talk about uh, everything and get this all on the record, including the reforming of that contract, which has way too many holes in it, uh, in my opinion. Uh, one of the reasons Fargo is doing so well, and I'm going to check this out, uh, this is a question, do they have a lot lower taxes than we do? It's a capital city. 
But I do know one of the reasons they're succeeding very well in North Dakota. I'll check it out. Uh, they have gas fields and new oil discoveries uh, just west of their capital. Of course, they've got a lot of new jobs up there from uh, oil expansion with the tar sands. <clears throat> Uh, I think uh, one of the best ways to deal with uh, the remaining two years of the economic development tax is to let the city just run its own program and let's see what you can do. Uh, I have to believe you can do better. I just have to believe you can do better than what I'm saying. And when I see empty warehouses in an industrial park, that's what Forbesville is. It's all industrial. I see no need to be going out and buying more land for an industrial park south of town. We've already got about 500 acres, and yet they continue to add to it and add to it, and there's only one business out there. And, uh, I, you know, for lack of a better word, I, I just think it's ridiculous. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Redbender. Another item before the council? If not, we are adjourned.